Hello, Woodman family. I'm so glad that you've joined us today for online worship. And for those of you who might be tuning in for the very first time, please receive my most sincere, through the screen, welcome. Even though we're not meeting physically together right now as a large group on the weekends, there are still lots of ways that you can get connected here at Woodman. You can join a community group, share prayer requests, and much more on our website, woodmanvalley.org, by clicking on the Connect Today button. If you enjoyed that first song we sang today, it's actually a brand new song that was written right here by our Woodman worship team this summer. It's a prayer that God would tune our hearts and focus our minds on his power. So let's pray for that now, and then we'll continue to worship. Father God, we come to you today and ask that you would strengthen us with your power and your might. Lord, would you renew our minds and help us to see what you are doing in the world today, what you are doing in our community, what you are doing right here in our own homes, in our own lives. God, we believe that you are with us, that you are for us, that you love us, and that you are reviving our land for your glory. So God, would you be with us now as we lift up your name. In Jesus' name, amen.
the city Oh God of revival Pour it out Pour it out Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains hit the ground Oh God of revival Pour it out Pour it out I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Well, hello, Woodman. You know, by now, I think most of the kids in our church are, we'll say, in school, sort of, mostly in. Well, they're attending, but not, well, not, you know what I mean. So for them, that means homework, assignments, tests, and quizzes. So I thought, in solidarity, we'd start with a quiz ourselves. One question quiz. If you were in the market for another church, which you're not, but if you had to be, what would be the most important thing you want to see in that next place you go? What's the one non-negotiable that if it's not there, you're going to simply keep looking. I don't like it when, when anybody leaves our church. Admittedly, sometimes it's easier when some people do, but that's never my first choice. But I realize there are situations, there are times when you have to. And when you go to that next place, you need to ensure that they constantly proclaim the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ before you commit. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of good things they could be doing, but unless they are proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, that place is dead. There will be no life change for you to celebrate. At best, you'll be wasting your time. And at worst, potentially fall away. There are so many things that we could do. And they would have a positive impact on people. But apart from the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it would all be temporary. And we began this new series, Undivided, looking at the New Testament letter of 1 Corinthians. And one of the issues at the church in Corinth was that they had descended into division and disunity. Simply put, I mean, they had begun to lose their way. And it wasn't intentional. It's not something they set out to do. But in time, they had begun to water down the gospel message. And in doing so, they were emptying the cross of its power. The Apostle Paul writes, in part, to get him back on the program. And the passage we're going to look at today unpacks why this matters so much. He's able to use them, the recipients, as an example of the power found in the gospel. 
And then indirectly, he calls them to follow his example. We are in the midst of an unprecedented time. It's a time with deep and complex problems. And it's a time with no shortage of opinions as to how we are to fix them. The part that we play, the part that we play as a church is the part the church has always been called to play. And that is to go and to make disciples. To call people to repentance. Encourage them to put their faith in Jesus Christ. We want to love well and see lives changed through Jesus. And I'll tell you, only the gospel message has the power to get that done. Are you confident that it still works? Are you confident that the real thing, the only thing that can change people is that transforming relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to look at. So if you would, pray with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for saving me. I thank you uh, for the thousands of men and women, young and old at Woodman, that you've called to faith in yourself. God, forgive us for the times when we can get about something else, when we can forget the power of the cross. Lord, would you use this time to strengthen us, to encourage us to go out and fulfill that great commission. Lord, I pray that you would help me now not to make any mistakes, say anything wrong. God, would your spirit speak and meet with us now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're beginning at verse 18. And you may remember that a portion of this passage we're going to look at is the same passage we studied this past Easter. So if you're new to this stuff, and maybe Easter was your first service, you're kind of like, oh, how embarrassing. They don't know we've already done this one. Well, kind of the way that you might watch a movie again and again and then pick up new things every time, to a much greater degree, uh, the Bible is, it, is living and active. We go to it routinely, and each and every time the Spirit of God can teach us. So we're not going to simply rehash all that we said last time, but look to God to give us fresh words. We want to study this with fresh eyes and see what God has for us. We're called to confidence in the gospel. What Paul's going to do is unpack some things that that is not, what, what, what is not supposed to be present, but so often can creep in. Here's the first one. It's not about wisdom, but power. It's not about wisdom, but power. We read in verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. As we said at Easter, right, we group people in hundreds of ways. Nationality, race, socioeconomic standing. We have lots of labels. The Bible has two. Perishing, not perishing. You're either perishing or being saved. Those are the options. There are no other categories. And the difference between the two is not simply heaven or hell, but at its core is your understanding, your view of the cross. And unfortunately for many people, well, they don't view it favorably. It is folly or foolishness to them. A crucified Messiah just does not 
compute. They, they cannot make sense of it. The thing that we can easily gloss over, though, is that this is how God rolls. Paul goes on to quote the Old Testament prophet Isaiah in verse 19. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. It's like throughout human history, we as humans... Humanity's been trying to play hot potato with God. Only instead of trying to get rid of the hot potato, we we cling to it, burning our hands in the process. We can outsmart you, we tell ourselves. Like the toddler that says, me can do it, me can do it. We defiantly shake our fist at him. And God's like, no. No, 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 you actually, you can't. You cannot do this. And, I, and, and I'm going to destroy your wisdom. I'm, I'm going to thwart your discernment. We cannot save ourselves from perishing. On our own, we need help. It's just that so many people, they just, they just don't see it. Paul calls the question, verse 20, where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? He's pointing to all their intellect, all all the ones they hold in high esteem. Where are they now? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. (laughs) We used to have this this bulldog who was was more human uh, than probably dog uh, named Newman. And, and he had a little crate, and, and he liked his crate, and we had it in a corner. And every now and then, I would want to sweeten the deal just a little bit for him. So I'd kind of throw a treat in, and the crate was decent on its own. But with the treat, this just blew his canine mind, right? And so he would charge to go in. And more often than not, uh, to, to Newman's everlasting shame, this, this happened more than once. I would not have opened the door all the way. And Newman and his little bulldog broad shoulders would go charging in and his right shoulder would be up against the side of the entrance and his left shoulder up against that door and he would simply try to push his way in. But the crate being in the corner, it does not move and so it was just pause. And I would go up and I would try to pull him back, but he saw what he wanted and he wouldn't let go until finally I would have to say, Newman, sit! And as he obeyed, I could then open the door and he could freely go in and get what he wanted. We as people thought we knew better than God. And we turned from him. And then we told ourselves, we can figure it out. This sin problem that we brought into the world, this death that awaits us all, rather than listening, we pushed ourselves against him and his ways. And God was like, no. You can keep pushing. You can keep straining. But the only thing that will work is for you to stop, listen to me, trust me. Your way is not going to work. Verse 22, 
Paul goes on to say, for Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The Jews wanted proof. They wanted signs. And the Greeks, they wanted it to make sense. They they wanted this to fit into the box that they had created. And preaching a crucified Messiah did not satisfy either. And a lot of people still struggle with the same thing today. Maybe even you. I hear it when people come and they say things, well, if God is real... Why doesn't he just show himself? Not all that different than the Jews. I want a sign. If you are who you say you are, do something magnificent right now to prove it. If you are who you say you are, God, come down. Open that door. Do something. We do the same things as the Greeks. When when we look at this world around us, And then we judge God by our estimation. Okay, so if God is sovereign, he's in control of everything. That's what you tell us, right? And and if God is good, you're saying he's loving. Then why why another hurricane? Hmm? How does that make sense? We, We still... We still ask for signs. We still want things to make sense in our own estimation. In either case, we're trying to get God to measure up to what we think. We're we're trying to make God fall into our way of thought. And in both cases, God's like, no. To be blunt, since we are the ones drowning, right? We are the ones drowning. And it's God's prerogative to choose if he wants to save us, which he does, and how he's going to get that saving done. It is well within his right to choose the way in which he will redeem a people for himself. God is the one who gets to pick how we know him. And it has pleased him to save us through the folly of what we preach. It has pleased God to save us through a crucified Messiah for the forgiveness of our sins. It is folly to those who are perishing, yes, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The good news is, this means that any of you who are listening to me right now can be saved. You can have your life now transformed and ensure that your future is secure by confessing Jesus Christ as Lord and believing that God raised him from the dead. You can be saved right now. What is stopping you from doing so? And if you want to talk to us about it, Please, let us know. Now, what is hard? What's hard for us who already believe to hear is the thing that could be stopping them Well, it could be us. 
we, we could be the stumbling block. We do, we do so when we, I never think it's really intentionally, it's rather unintentional. But we do so whenever we communicate. The, the gospel is important, but plus there's something else too that matters. When I was growing up, there were, in my estimation, some people who it seemed like they believed the gospel plus what I wore to church on Sunday is what was going to get me saved. There are people today, I think, who think it's the gospel plus getting your life in order that, that gets you to being saved. There are people who think it's the gospel plus taking a certain stand on a specific issue in a particular way. Uh, those two things is, is what gets you saved. But the reality is it is the gospel alone that saves us. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that is the thing that gets it done. We had nothing to it. We were dead in our sin, but God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. It might not make sense, but that is where the power is. That alone has the power to save. Do you believe it? It's not about wisdom, but power. And here's the second thing. It's not about merit, but grace. Verse 26. For consider your calling, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now, if you tuned in last week, you may remember, right, the Corinthians had become a little puffed up in amongst themselves. Uh, they had divided themselves into these little warring factions. One person following this guy, someone else following another. And in each case, sort of patting themselves on the back for having chosen so wisely. And in verse 26 to 31 here, Paul is essentially saying, would you guys just take one minute and do me a favor and just look around? Just, just look around. Really? What are you boasting about? Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. And that is on purpose. You are a living illustration of the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are not saved by who we were, but that we're saved through grace. Jesus is the one who does the saving. And God did, this, God did this on purpose so that none of us can boast because we before him realize we have nothing to boast about. It is because of him, God, that I am in Christ Jesus. It is not because of anything I have earned. He is my righteousness. When God looks at me, he no longer sees my failures. He sees the righteousness of Christ. It's Jesus' work, not mine. He is my sanctification. God is changing me through the power of his Holy Spirit day in and day out. Jesus is getting that done, not me. And he is my redemption. Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin. And with his blood, he has purchased me for himself. I'm no longer separated from God. And consequently, my life is no longer bound up anymore in what I think I need to do or what I might feel I have to get done. It's not my effort. It's his 
My problem is, however, I can tell myself that I know that to be true and yet internally still think of myself as pretty good. A theologian, biblical commentary, uh, commentator, D.A. Carson, he used this illustration. Have you, ever, have you ever had an argument with somebody? Hmm? Look around, have you? Mm-hmm. Ever left that argument? Maybe you're in the car. Do you ever replay it in your mind? Do you ever do the I woulda, coulda, shoulda, if I had just said this, if this had happened? And, and you, you just go through the whole thing again. Let me ask this. How often, when you play it back in your mind, do you lose that argument? We never do, right? We always will win because we're so smart. We're so witty. We're so certain that we are right. If only I'd had another run at it, I would have been victorious. In our minds, we always win. We are prone to think of ourselves as better than we actually are. But Paul says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. If you're going to boast, don't boast about yourself. Boast in the Lord. And I don't do that. Well, not always anyways. Certainly, I don't say these things out loud. I mean, I know enough not to. But I'm proud of some of the things that I've attained. I I am grateful for some of the decisions that I've made. There are things that I think set me apart from other people. There are things... that in my heart, I boast about. And yet, I know that none of them will even cross my mind when I stand before Jesus face to face. I know everything about that day will be solely and wholly because of him and the grace that he's shown me. I have done nothing, nothing to merit the grace that I have been shown, the grace that I daily get to enjoy. And I honestly do look forward to that day when my sinful little heart stops telling me otherwise. It is not me. It is him. We need to be convinced of this in our church. We need to be undivided on this subject. We need to be able to look at somebody radically different than ourselves, be it from a different nation, be it of a different race, having perhaps committed what in our estimation is the most grotesque sin we can imagine, or whether they've attained all that the world holds dear and we would ever hope to have, we need to look with confidence and tell them there is only one name under heaven by which men and women can be saved, and it's not yours. It's Jesus Christ. There's nothing we do to earn it. It is a gift of grace. And we can disagree on a lot. But that is non-negotiable. The gospel is not about the merit of people. But the grace of God. This is our mission. And it leads us to our last point. It's not about us, but others. Look at second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1. And I, this is Paul speaking, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul's hope was that when he had finished speaking, 
People wouldn't walk away thinking he's a great preacher. Paul's hope was that the hearts would be changed by the power of the gospel. So he says, when I came to you, I did not come proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. And that refers to both the content of what he shared and the manner in which he shared it. Which to understand why this is a deal for him, there's a little Corinthian context we need to know. In Corinth, the Corinthians were fans of these professional speakers and teachers. They were experts in rhetoric. They could hold an audience's attention with their masterful language, and they had this ability to convince people of their position. Paul, right from the get-go, I was not one of those people. Now, that is not to say that Paul did not work on his sermons. He did. We studied uh, the, the book of Acts recently, and we saw the different ways, depending on who's there, how Paul would teach and contextualize the gospel. He put effort into his preaching. And it's not to say that he wasn't a good preacher either. They may have thumbed their nose at him from time to time, but Paul could throw it down. Paul knew how to bring some fire. But it is to say he was playing a decidedly different game than the popular or influential in Corinth were. He was not trying to be one of the household names of the day. He was not trying to win their approval or their accolades. He came to preach Christ. Which what he said in verse 2, For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And that's not like Paul saying that he exclusively only preached on that, like that he had one message that he just kept going to. No, it wasn't that he exclusively preached on that, but what he's saying is that Jesus and his crucifixion was central to all that he taught. Anything he had to say about everything was framed up by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. No matter what the subject, Paul landed the plane, the very same place, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you know, he could have stopped right there. He could have said, I didn't come with lofty speech or wisdom, but he doesn't stop. He goes on to say, and this is quite transparently, how he did come. He says how he didn't come, and now he's going to say how he did come. And he says he comes in weakness, fear, and much trembling. Look at verse 3. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Quite opposite than the professionals that stepped off the bus in Corinth with their dark glasses and their big headphones and their designer suits. He came in weakness, in fear, and in trembling. Not exactly sure what Paul was thinking of when he said he came weak. Could have been sickness. Could have been the lack of material sustenance. The Corinthians probably knew what he was referring to. I'm guessing the Corinthians had maybe talked in hushed tones about the very thing. Oh, he doesn't seem very healthy, does he? He doesn't have much money, did you know? But what Paul does make clear, Paul is placing himself among the weak of the world that God sent to shame the strong. Paul's like, yeah, I am not like them. I am weak. And his fear and much trembling could certainly and understandably understandably be legit fear of opposition. When we were in Acts, we saw in Acts chapter, where was it, 18, 
how God gave, gave, gave Paul a little pep talk because he was facing so much opposition, but I don't think that's what Paul's talking about here. I think what it means is that he came with fear and trembling before God. Because Paul recognized, better than maybe anyone, that every time he preached, there's actually an audience of one, and God the Father was listening. And he did not want to make a mistake. He knew he had a big responsibility here. And he knew he didn't want to do anything to steal the limelight from the one who should rightly be center stage. What he wanted to do was to make sure that his speech and message were not implausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Why? It's what he answers in verse 5. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, and that's both men and women, but in the power of God. He wanted people to follow, not him, but the God, the Savior, to whom he was pointing them to. Not to follow him per se, but his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He did not want to be held in high esteem. He did not want people to honor him. Those belong to God and God alone. And honestly, I think for some pastors today, that is humbling to consider. I think for some aspiring pastors today, it could be downright disheartening. You know, in the New Testament, the picture of a pastor was often that of a shepherd. And it was a picture that everybody readily understood. Today, I don't know when it changed, but lots of other pictures get thrown around. Pastor as CEO, pastor as visionary, pastor as leadership guru. And yet I think if Paul spent any time in our culture, he might have another picture in mind for pastor. That of an Uber driver. I don't use Uber much here in the Springs, uh, but a lot of times if, if I travel, it's sometimes less hassle and less expensive to just get an Uber. Many a time when Kim and I maybe get all dressed up for the fancy dinner, get that Uber on his or her way, get in, exchange pleasantries, talk about things, and almost every time I leave, I'm real quick to say, hey, thank you. Always give them five stars, regardless of how I felt. You know the one thing I've never done? Never invited the Uber driver to join us. I don't want to be crass, but it was, it was the means to the end. What's so profound about the Apostle Paul is Paul desperately wanted to be the one who got the people to the party. He did not want to be the center of the party people got to. He wanted to proclaim the glory and power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and have people walk away, blown away by the truth that they could be saved. It was not about him. It was about others. And it should be the same for us. We are called to go and make disciples. 
everything. Everything else is secondary to that. And when it's done right, people should not praise us, but give glory to our Father who's in heaven. We are to offer ourselves a living sacrifice to connect people, to point people, to tell people of the power of the gospel. Let us be confident that God is going to get that done through us. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I pray that you would place a fire in our bellies to share. Uh, God, that we would take some of the things that can divide us. And God, point people to the one thing we all agree. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the only thing that can save. Father, bring us souls, we ask. Unify us toward this mission. In Jesus' name, amen.
You know, a lot of times I think some of us hear a message like that, spend time in a service like this, and we want to respond. And we just, we, we're not sure how. You know, right now at the beginning of a new ministry year for us, there are several ways. You could host a huddle in your home, be a huddle leader here on campus. Uh, you could lead a community group. Uh, you could do what we're talking about, point other people to Jesus Christ, remind them of the gospel that you receive by faith. You could serve with our students. You think we as grown-ups think it's a little nutty. It's crazy town for them right now. How sweet would it be if you could be the man or the woman that points somebody to Jesus and a young soul embraces Christ, has their life transformed now, and their eternity secure. God could do that through you. And before you tell me, I'm not really good at that, I'm not very comfortable, <laughs> that's kind of how God likes it. He uses people like us to get his thing done. And we'd love to get you plugged in in any way we can so that the power of Christ could shine through you. So as you go, go with this. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. God bless you and have a great week.